Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar this afternoon again. I am Andrea Cippa. I would like to introduce you to uh, Jim, who is a shelter consultant. He has more than 50 years experience in the shelter and the site planning uh, uh, field. I give uh, straight away the word to Jim, who is going to share his screen. Thank you very much, Andrea, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here, and thank you, ASEM, for the translation and support. Okay, welcome to everybody. Sorry about the slight hiccup uh, with the technical ecstasy there. Um, today's presentation is about site planning in urban areas. I'm going to try and make this as linked as possible to the context in and around Syria, uh, just to say that I have done some work in Syria myself, uh, but that was back in 2013, uh, so already a few years ago. Uh, but since then, I have worked uh, doing site planning for Syrian communities in northern Iraq, uh, in Lebanon and in Jordan, and also more recently in Europe. Um, so the pictures I'm going to show are a mix of all of these different places, uh, but I think that the messages and the learnings will be very, very relevant for the Syrian context. Um, just to jump through, this is the session agenda. Um, we're going to look at what are common types of different sites. Um, and just to say um, very quickly, I'm going to use the word sites, not camps, uh, for this hour. Um, camps tend to imply that they are very planned, uh, very regular, um, and actually in many cases uh, in urban areas, they aren't, they are not planned, they are not regular, um, and they can have lots of different types, and I want to talk through that. So I'm gonna use the word sites as a more general phrase. I may use the word camps when I want to talk about planned, places, but more generally I'll talk about sites. Um, I want to talk really then about hazards and risks, um, whether the site can and should exist or whether it is potentially dangerous or life-threatening. Um, I want to then talk about priorities and needs. Uh, what are the priorities if you can't do everything, if you can't solve every site planning problem in an urban area. Um, then I want to mention briefly, uh, thinking about the host community. And the host community is everybody living around the site or working around the site or having some sort of economic interest or community around the site. Um, I then want to spend some time actually saying, okay, what can we do for site planning interventions, how can we go into a site, make improvements uh, in an urban area? What is different about doing it in an urban area? And then I want to say what happens next. And this means you do something, something happens, and you have to do something again. That when we are planning sites, we don't just do it once. Things happen, things change. We have to keep on, keep on, keep on site planning as a process. Um, and that process goes all the way until the end of the lifespan when the site is closing down. Um, and then how do we do that in an urban area? What do we need to know about? I guess the question first is, why is site planning in urban areas important? Um, this photo uh, on the screen is actually from Kurdistan. Uh, and you can see that there is um, a, a, a tent, a UNHCR, um, but there's also other buildings. Um, site planning in urban areas is important, um, firstly because more and more people around the world are finding themselves in sites in urban areas. This situation is more and more common, but also it's more and more complex I want to show you two more photos to show a, a comparison, to show what I mean. Um, this is a, 
a site, actually I'm going to use the word now, planned camp. This is a planned camp, uh, also in northern Iraq. Um, and you can see two or three things. Uh, there is some infrastructure. You can see the, um, the electricity cables and you can see the lighting. Um, and you can see it's a very straight road. Uh, you can get maybe two vehicles along the road. And you can see that there's nothing else. There are the tents, there are the water tanks, uh, and then there's just mountains and hills around. I want to contrast, I want to contrast this picture with this picture. And this is another camp originally planned as well um, at the edges of the city and sort of being becoming part of a city also in northern Iraq. And you can see there, uh, if you didn't know where it is, you can see the, the Kurdish flag somewhere in the background. But what you can also see is so many other things. You can see not just the lights and the electricity, but you can see cars. You know that maybe there are people who don't live in the camp who are coming in and out or going through. And you can see shops and you can see a very complex economy. And suddenly things are becoming much, much more difficult and much more challenging. And so this is why I think the topic is so interesting because of these very complex challenges for when we find sites, even if they are planned at first, inside or at the edges of cities inside or at the edges of urban areas. Um, we've got a few learning objectives for this session. Um, first, just to talk a little bit about what are the differences between sites in urban areas and sites in rural areas, these two photos that I showed. And I want to really try and make sure, and, and please, uh, if you have questions, um, ask questions as we go along, but um, always try and remind me why is this different in urban areas? Why is this different in cities? Um, what is the difference between normal site planning, which is challenging, and site planning in urban areas, which is differently challenging or super extra challenging? Um, and then looking at different types of sites, and we'll do that in a minute in the next part of this session, um, and looking at what are the possible advantages and disadvantages, in fact, risks um, in some of the different sites. How does that change from one type of site, one category of site to another? And, and how to engage, what to do about the possible advantages and the possible risks or dangers. And then based on those, based on that analysis, how to design, how to choose what to do to make sites better. And how to think of that, as I said, as a process, as something we have to do again and again and again and again, reacting always to everything that everybody else is doing in a very busy life in those sites. I just wanted to say, um, uh, hopefully we do the whole thing in an hour. Um, it's, Therefore, mainly an introduction. Um, I want to just make very clear and apologies to anybody who has hopes for other aspects of this topic, um, just to say what we will and what we won't have time for. Um, what we will cover is how to work with lots of different people uh, in site planning. Who are the different actors? Who are the different stakeholders? Um, how to think realistically what is possible, what is not possible in very complex, challenging, problematic situations. Um, how to think about what's happening outside the site. Um, that photo of the rural camp where it was just hills around. You don't get that in a city. You have people and buildings around. What does that mean? Um, how to think of it as a process. Again, I'm going to keep on saying this again and again and again. However, what we are not going to cover, unfortunately, maybe that'll be opportunities for other 
presentations, other sessions, um, we're not looking at just single designs of single shelters. Um, we're also not really going to look at what happens inside collective centers. That is big buildings, permanent buildings with lots of people living inside. Um, we're also not going to have a chance to look at design software, engineering software, and we're not going to look at many of the calculations, the mathematical uh, part of the engineering. And we're also not going to look at money costs. So those are some things which I think got covered in some of the other sessions, um, but uh, we're not going to have a chance to cover them here. Sorry. I want to go forward into the agenda and talk about common types of sites. I think, you know, it's, um, if you think about an, a rural camp, um, they tend to look somewhat the same as, you know, straight squares. Um, you know, every so often you have a water point, uh, every block of shelters has one latrine and one shower block, etc. One of the challenges about urban sites is that there's no two sites that's the same. They're so different. I want to make some points here. Some sites are planned and constructed before people actually arrive, um, things which might still be called planned camps. Um, some urban sites, many, I would say most, are not planned. Um, people arrive, people start putting things together, people put shelters over their heads, uh, and then <laughs> the humanitarian site planners arrive and try and figure out what to do. Um, and many, many in urban areas are what I would call hybrid, half and half. Um, that is that maybe there was a small part that was planned or was supported or was constructed by humanitarians or by local government. And then more and more people come around and, and create an area much bigger, which is spontaneous, which was not planned, not designed. And you see that a lot also with collective centers, that you have um, something, a school or another big building, and then more and more people putting their shelters around the sides to take advantage of any of the services, any of the other support happening inside that big building in the middle. Um, so I want to look at some of these more common types of sites. Um, the first one we find in many cases, uh, if people are coming in spontaneously without planning beforehand, without a design, coming into public parks. And th the reasons are obvious. I mean, public parks, some, most of them are pretty central. Um, they may have some shade uh, and some local water supply. Otherwise, how are the parks going to stay green? Um, and parks that are in the city are often near to some commercial or shopping areas. People come to visit the parks, they come to play in the parks, they take their children to the parks, and somebody always will put some restaurants nearby or some clothes shops or other things like that. So always commercial shopping areas. And this means that those commercial shopping areas will already have electricity supply, already have lighting, already have maybe some extra water supply, independent water supply as well, as well as just being able to have the delivery vehicles for food or anything like that. Um, and also parks, not always, but often are divided already into sections, some sections with paths going between. So you might be able to also have your site in a park divided into sections as well, uh, so that you have some organization there. The disadvantages are obvious. Um, environmental damage. Uh, parks are usually with at least some soft, muddy areas, so possible drainage issues. And then also many parks don't have pretty, don't have good lighting all through the night, um, and maybe therefore security risks for people staying there. The next fairly common type of site is um, also an open space in the middle of the city. And it's what I would call a plaza, uh, a maidan, uh, a shopping um, open area, um, a space in the middle of the city, which 
uh, originally might have been a bigger market. Now it's a big square with buildings all the way around. Um, and often very central, uh, might have been actually the center of a city or town. Um, because of its origins as a market, these areas uh, are still connected with a lot of commercial activity, a lot of um, delivery of supplies possible, and also, again, very close to electricity and other infrastructure supply, including possibly drainage back out. The disadvantages. Um, most of these, unlike parks, are going to have hard surfaces. So you're not going to be able to find any way to dig pit latrines, for instance, or to put foundations in for shelters in case of bad weather or high winds. And also, if they're in the old part of the city, they're usually in places where the roads are much more narrow, and therefore it's going to be um, much more difficult to get both deliveries, but also emergency vehicles uh, into those areas. Um, and then also, if the plazas are being owned by people with commercial interests, shop owners, there may be eventually social tensions with people living in the site, in this spontaneous site, um, who have nothing. And then the third type I want to talk about, hybrids, the sort of 50-50 half half types. These are sites which are probably started when there's a, either a collective center, uh, lots of people come running into a school, occupying a school or into a sports center or into a big commercial building or into an unfinished block of apartments. And then more people come round afterwards and build up more and more of their own shelters around and around and around. And the original building or the original small planned camp acts as a magnet because in that magnet in that original building um, there might be food distributions there might be medical support there might be other things happening and as i said this is the most diverse category it can be schools it could be places of religious worship uh, or it could be older shopping malls or things like that I want to talk about um, some of the advantages and disadvantages, um, but just to say for the hybrids, um, the, the advantages and disadvantages are a little bit difficult to generalize because they are so different one from the other. Um, it's possible that there's water supply and hygiene facilities if it's a sports hall or if it's a school uh, or if it's a mosque. Um, sometimes there are walls going around, for instance, if it's a school and there might be better security. This might not be the case if it's an old shopping center. Um, and even if you're living in a shelter outside the building, you might be able to run inside the building if there's bad weather or if there's other risks. The disadvantages are often the land and the building are privately owned. Uh, there'll be pressure to leave, to be pushed out of the school or other places. Um, and then also that many times it's hard surfaces. It's difficult to put down safe foundations to secure things. I want to talk now about some hazards and risks generally. And this applies for everywhere, all of the different types of sites that I've talked about. Um, the hazards and risks essentially um, can be life-threatening. Uh, what I want to talk about is actually, firstly, can a site and the people in the site actually survive? Or is there anything which would make the location possibly deadly um, does this apply to the whole of the site or to just one area? Um, and I want to say that, you know, there has to be before anything else, a sort of yes, no decision, a stop 
or a go no go decision um, because in a way closing a site or tr transferring moving a site to another place is also a part of site planning um, natural disasters uh, i have to be very careful whenever i show this photo um, uh, this is in no way a criticism of UNHCR. Uh, I've worked with UNHCR, UNHCR in many places. Um, and so the, the fact that it's UNHCR tents in the middle of the very flooded area here is by no means meant as a criticism of UNHCR, but it is uh, a good photo illustrating one of the natural hazards, which is flooding. Um, but we can also imagine that in urban areas, you can also have high winds, including things falling off buildings into the site. Um, there might be a, a history of earthquakes. And again, earthquakes might not affect tents, but they can affect buildings falling in if the site is too close to large buildings. Um, hazards can also mean things which are not natural disaster hazards. They can mean social tensions, uh, risks uh, for um, potential life and death, but certainly threats, um, threats of violence. It can happen between different groups uh, living all together inside the site, um, whether that's different generations, different ethnic groups, um, different social groups. Um, it can also also be very often social tensions between those in the site and those who are the hosts living around. Um, but I want to say that site planning in urban areas, in cities, um, can make an impact on this. Um, because if you have too many people in too little space, it's going to raise tensions. And very often, a site in a city will not have a regular big square, it'll be going off down different streets or different small narrow parts of the city already. And is there a way that urban planners and site planners can work together to try and move people into bigger areas or identify other larger spaces, even if it's only for a short period of time? And then the other risk with this social tensions is if a site is in the middle of the city, you saw that photo I showed at the beginning uh, from Kurdistan, from Dormiz, with all of the cars. Cars from outside the site might be coming in and out. Strangers, people you don't know, might be coming in and out of the site. Most of them probably just to see or to visit friends or to sell things or to buy things, but they're strangers. People might feel tensions about that. Another massive life and death uh, photo. Um, this is not from Syria or Iraq, um, but it is a very good photo uh, of a very bad situation. You can see this was uh, actually uh, a planned camp uh, at the edges of a city, and you can see the city um, edges at the top of the photo, and you can see that two-thirds of that camp uh, which was built inside a sports stadium. I think at the top of the camp, you can see the, the seating area of the stadium. Um, two thirds of that camp burned down in one fire in one night. And the only reason why the rest of the camp didn't burn down is because it, between the burnt area and the not burnt area was this fire break, this gap uh, created by having all of the latrines and the shower blocks. But before then, all of the shelters in the camp burnt down altogether. And this is a very high risk in urban areas because very often in urban areas, shelters are too close together. Very often in urban areas, uh, in sites in urban areas, because they're spontaneous sites, there's less evacuation routes or no evacuation routes. And also, therefore, not only no routes to get out, but no routes for emergency vehicles, fire rescue vehicles to come back in. And urban sites may have more risks specifically because they're in the middle of a city. 
fires can come from outside of the site. It might be another building. It might be another shop that is burning. Um, fires can be created not just by flames, uh, but by bad electricity connections. And we see that a lot in urban areas, um, especially that process of people trying to get the electricity <laughs> from the buildings and connect it into their own shelters. And if a site is in the middle of a plaza or near some other commercial area, there's gonna be lots of flammable materials, whether that's oil, fuel, types of cloth, other chemicals, things like that. And also, if those sites are in overcrowded spaces, just the sheer amount of people makes the risk higher. I wanna also talk about public health risks. Public health risks can be very invisible, but if we look at the site plan, we can usually, or we visit the site, we can usually see where those health risks are coming from. Um, and I think this is becoming more and more a conversation, especially in the last 12 months. Uh, but I just want to say, um, even before coronavirus, even before COVID-19, there were many very, very unhealthy sites in urban areas around the world with other diseases. And it's just quite obvious, people living close together can transmit lots of different diseases. Um, but in these urban areas, where you might have a lot of economic activity, a lot of markets, but not so much drainage. You might have dirty water, you might have pollution. Um, in the same way, you might have other rats, insects, carriers of disease. And also in urban areas, you might be in or next to uh, a industrial area, a workshop, a factory with smoke or with industrial products which may also be causing illnesses, particularly respiratory illnesses. And then I also wanna talk a little um, about protection and gender-based violence as a particular risk um, in sites. And I just want to say, nowhere in the world is free of these risks, um, but one of the main background causes or one of the main reasons why these risks can increase is if people are too crowded together. Um, and the risks can be worse in city areas. Again and again, this question of um, the site being in the middle of something else, being connected with something else, having people coming in, going through, um, and not knowing who everybody is. Um, but also, all of those other hazards, whether it's flooding, uh, whether it's uh, other risks of fire, evacuation problems, blocked streets can also just make it more difficult for women and girls especially to either avoid and go around or to escape from any possible threats, risks or attacks. So now that we have looked at some of the types of sites. And now that we've looked at some of the risks and hazards and some of the risks and hazards specific to cities, to urban areas, I wanted to just go through what then should we be thinking about? How do we plan? What's our strategy? What do we look for first? What do we do first? And then what do we do next? And I guess this list here, is a good starting point. It's quite general, but I think it's going to be applicable to most of the urban sites that we are finding in Syria and around Syria. Um, the first one is very obvious. Is this a dangerous place or not? Is this a place where people should never be because it's too dangerous? Is this a place where people are likely to be killed? And then the next ones in terms of life and death are, can you get enough water into the camp? And can you get enough water back out? Can you get enough water so people can live um, by drinking? Um, or can you get, and can you make sure that the camp is not flooded so that there's no risk there? After that, looking at all of those other risks, whether it's 
from flooding, whether it's from you know, high wind, whether it's fire risks, um, whether it's social tensions and the risk of uh, rioting or social unrest. Um, what are the minimum evacuation and emergency access routes for people who need to get out very quickly and people who need to get in very quickly? And then how do you mitigate? How do you reduce? How do you control the risk of fire? How do you reduce? How do you control? How do you mitigate other security risks, social unrest, but also personal attacks, especially on people who are most vulnerable? whether they are from different ethnic groups, disabled, women and girls. Um, what can you do about public health risks, especially if people are too close together? And then not just life and death, but what can you do positively? How can you make sure that people have access to basic services? Uh, that is to shops, to health, to education. And in urban areas and cities, those Health posts, hospitals, those schools might not be in the site. They could be just next door in the city. But how can we make sure that everybody has access? Everybody living in the site can go to the schools or the health services or whatever outside. Um, what can site planning in an urban area do for community security, community organization? How can you support the economy, the livelihoods, people's jobs, people looking after themselves. And what does the environment mean in a city? I mean, you would think, okay, come on, it's just concrete. Mm -mm. Every city has an environment and we should think about that. Um, I want to address over the next two slides, ways- uh, Jim, Jim, just one question Yeah. Uh, on, the, on this side. Uh, uh, please go back. Yes, reduce security risk and uh, provide uh, okay provide access to basic service. Yes, that's the uh, in my opinion. That's the work of the site planner to identify the basic server. Where is the health center? Where are the schools? Mm. Where is the water? But then, once the site planner has identified the existence or the non-existence of those services. That's the sectorial intervention. So the wash people should think about the water, the health people should think about the health, and the education people should think mm. about the education, not the site planner. Please tell me if I am wrong. Absolutely. Um, I would be a little bit careful with two verbs, maybe. Um, I think one is, um, and you are totally correct, Andrea, one is to provide basic services. That is somebody from the education sector provides education. Somebody from the health sector provides health support. Um, but I think the site planner has a quite central role with those in the other sectors and in the urban areas with local government authorities um, to say, firstly, how do people get there? Do they have access? Um, are there those places already existing and with capacity outside of the site? If you walk out of the plaza, if you walk out of the park and you go 100 meters, 200 meters, will you get to a, a, a pharmacy? Will you get to a hospital? Will you get to a kindergarten? Can those also be used by the people in the site? Because if so, then you don't need to build one inside the site. But if you do need to build one inside the site, um, I think the site planner needs to be talking with everybody to say, okay, look, um, where do we need to put it? Um, where can we put it so that everybody in the site has access You know, Is it going to be in the center? Is it going to be next to the main road? Is it going to be away from the entrance so that it is only for people living in the site, uh, but not for people living around. Or, other way around, is it going to be at the front entrance so it can be shared between people living in the site and people living around the site? So that the location, the where do you put it, I would say um, is, is 
something which the site planner has uh, a more central role in, in discussing and, and uh, being part of that uh, decision making. Was, was that okay, Andrea? Uh, yes, yes, it's okay. Thank you, Jim. Go ahead. Um, I wanted again to, to just give some general directions for how to deal with uh, all of these, uh, all of the problems in this slide. So in the next two slides, just trying to give some suggestions. Um, I think firstly, um, every site, even if there are people already there, uh, you need to do some sort of risk assessment. Uh, and if you can't really let people stay there, you need to advocate for some other option, for closing the site down, for finding alternatives. Um, making sure that there's enough water can get into the site. Uh, it can be two or three different ways. Um, in cities, you can eventually look to see if you can connect the pipes, the infrastructure, rather than bringing trucks in and out. But also in many urban areas, in the commercial areas, there are people commercially selling water. Now, um, as we all know, buying water involves buying plastic water bottles. <laughs> you end up with a large collection of plastic water bottles in the site. Um, but still identifying water sources, firstly, that can be brought in temporarily, water sources that can be brought in more permanently, like connections to the water supply generally, or other options just outside the site in the surrounding host community, as long as you know that there's enough for everybody to share. Um, also talking about getting water out of the site, um, often, Parks, sometimes plazas, have actually been used to collect extra um, extra uh, surface runoff water and maybe a deliberate flood area. Um, that might be a hazard that you say, well, actually, we can't continue to have the site here. Um, but trying to figure out uh, what sort of city roads outside of the site, below the site, have drainage that can be connected into. And remembering that if that road's own drainage is not there or not adequate, that you may be creating more hazards, more flooding for people living on that road if that's the place where all of the site's own water is being channeled out. Um, and when you're looking at evacuation or emergency access routes, connected to what? In the urban, camp, you can just have an evacuation route into more open space, get people into the open, away from the risk, away from the fire, and you're okay, they'll survive. In cities, you need to connect that evacuation route to the city roads and to other open spaces in the city if they exist in the nearby. Um, and then thinking about controlling fires, Again and again, some fires will happen, may happen, could happen inside the site, but some might be in the city surrounding and some might happen in the site, but then put the city at risk. And so we need to think not just fire breaks in the middle of the shelters in the site, but do we also need to look at some sort of fire break between the site and the camp? Uh, sorry, the site and the city. And how does that connect with emergency access roads? How does that connect with the main traffic routes? Is that possible? Okay. Then thinking about security risks, even in a smaller site, even in a crowded site, what can we do to think about having neighborhoods? Areas where I've put watchful eyes, where people who are leaders of that neighborhood, uh, men or women, are gonna be sitting there and watching and keeping an eye on things and making sure that things are a bit calmer. And how can we have those areas, those community spaces, small, multifunctional, might be people who are watching whilst also selling vegetables, 
um, and decentralizing so that every neighborhood, every area in the site has that same possibility of neighborhood spaces, watchful eyes, people looking out for each other and a place to do so. Reducing public health risks. Here in Germany, we are told now that coronavirus one and a half meters distance between us can make a difference. How can we try and even get some distance even into very crowded places? But also there's been more discussion and I don't have good answers or good design examples for this. Um, how can we think about circulation so that we encourage people and encourage traffic to go in just one direction when they're going through a site instead of going both in double directions? Because a lot of the emerging lessons, and again, I'm very hesitant to make strong recommendations, but some research either for old people's homes, for hospitals, but also for supermarkets over the last 12 months has said somehow it reduces the risk if everybody's going in the same direction in one circle and then out again, instead of having people walking against each other, coming closer to each other. How can we do that? Is it possible to do that in spontaneous, self-built, unplanned sites in urban areas? And how does that circulation connect to the streets outside around the site? Um, in terms of access to basic services, again and again, some of the services, many of the services may be outside of the site. Um, whether they are outside the site, whether they're inside the site, again, this goes back to Andrea's question. It's not just a question of like, is there a school? That might be somebody from the education sector saying, we've got a design, <laughs> this is our temporary learning space. It's going to be more thinking about, can children actually get a path to the school? Can girls get a path that's safe to the school? And therefore, do we need to think not of having one big wide road that we could do in a rural area, but trying to find ways of removing lots and lots of small barriers one by one by one. And again, going back to the community security, community organization, that whole thing about neighborhood spaces, um, what's a neighborhood space during the daytime? What's a neighborhood space during the nighttime? Does it change? Does it become more like a commercial area at one point of the day? Um, and supporting livelihoods. It may be that the most opportunities, the most attractive places are actually not at the center of the site, but they're around the edges, close to where people from the rest of the city might also want to do some buying or selling. But can everybody in the site get there? Maybe there needs to be some sort of support for decentralized economy so that everybody can have some access. I'll talk about that a bit more in the next slides. And then looking at the environmental impact, and I've said very briefly, what does that mean for the whole city? Um, every city has its own environmental uh, regulations and figure out what that is. What can we do to get a win-win situation? I've talked there over the last three slides about priorities for site planners. On the next couple of slides, I actually want to bring up priorities and needs for people in the sites. Um, these are some common ones. It doesn't mean these are everyone. Uh, these are ones which are commonly shared in many countries. There may be some which are specific to some sites in Syria, which are not in the list, but these are some more of the common ones. Um, some of them are obviously also relevant for rural camps, but a lot of the time these are particularly relevant, particularly important in urban sites, in sites and cities. I just put this list, I think most importantly, people arriving in these sites will be saying, first, am I safe? Is my family safe? Secondly, does my family have privacy and dignity where we are sleeping tonight? 
Thirdly, where's everybody else that I know? Where's everybody else who I feel safe with, who I feel comfortable with, who can look after me and who I need to look after? And then how am I going to survive? How will I eat? Where can I earn money? What can I buy and sell? What if we are sick? And then the next one, whenever I talk to families, is always, always, always education. How can my children go to school? What is my children's future? And then also just how can I be normal again? I know I'm in a camp or a site, but I want to be a human being. How can I be normal? What can I do just to give myself a sense of that I'm, at least for the short time, in the best situation at home? And again, some basic guidance for how to think about this in an urban area um, and some challenges. Is my family safe in a shelter? What you'll see is that people living in sites for that priority, in order to react to their own priority, they may start to build extra barriers, extra walls, um, which create a risk. They can encroach paths, they can block emergency access, and they can bring shelters closer together, which might increase the risk of fire hazard or things like that. Um, does my family have privacy and dignity in the shelter? Um, people, again, might start to build barriers, but we also see in many of these sites, people starting to uh, pull more shelter together and just trying to make even pathways, their own private pathways. We also see a lot of people who are starting to get rubber pipes, uh, plastic pipes, and privatizing the water system so that they have privacy and dignity. Problem is nobody else in the rest of the neighborhood or the rest of the site can share that at all. Um, and then in terms of being close to family and community, you'll start to see people making super shelters, shelters which connect and connect because in one shelter is the family of the brother of another shelter. And then those other priorities. How will I eat today? People start building their own shops, um, becoming active in markets in popular places, and these become magnets. These become areas where more and more people arrive, um, but they can also uh, start to become no-go areas, uh, areas of heightened social risk uh, or security risks for other people. Um, what if we are sick? You'll start to find more and more people wanting shelters as close as possible to health posts or to pharmacies, but you also find people using health as an excuse to exclude and to push away vulnerable people, people who are different, people who might have a disability, things like that. Um, how can my children go to school? If the schools nearby in the city are not available, you may start to find groups, communities, um, starting to take over and privatize and dominate public spaces in order to create private schools. Um, and then this question of how much normal life can my family have? This is where you start to see people bringing in electric cables to make lights in a shelter, um, which is great, helps the children with the homework, uh, gives people more dignity, um, but it can be the source of an electric fire. And then now that we've thought about some of the priorities and needs and some of the risks of the site planners, of the people who live in the site, what about everybody else around the side? Um, I just wanna say a couple of quick things. The host community by general definition is just everybody living around, working around the site, even if they didn't volunteer. Um, there may be many host communities around a big site. There may be people um, of different ethnic groups or different religions or different economic status. Um, some people affected by the site might be a long distance away. If you work in the market near the site, you don't live there, you are still maybe part of the host community. Even though you live somewhere else, your own livelihoods, your own shop, your own market, is there and is affected. And therefore you are possibly also part of that bigger host community. And you think about some of the shared 
resources, resources that the host community is asked to share, whether they want to or not. Um, what does it mean to suddenly have twice as many children in the same school? What about competition for jobs, especially informal economy, uh, day jobs? Um, what about just basic water supply? You turn on your tap and suddenly only half the water is coming out. Or if you are ill, you are in pain, somebody else in your family is ill, and the queue to the health post is suddenly twice as long. Um, what about just so many people in the roads? And what about just things that you can't really see as visible, like just rising of prices when you go to the market the next time? Um, but also, what about things that are shared? Um, people will start buying and selling to each other. This tends to happen at the edges. I've said the interfaces, the edges, the areas, the lines between the site and the rest of the city. But is this area, this interchange, the place where the city and the site meet, is it just one single entrance? If the site has got a wall around it? Or is it a whole ring is this, if the site is open? Um, is that connection and those new markets and those new opportunities, is it happening on a public street or in private land? And what about the drainage, the environment, refuse? And also, how can you get access if there is an emergency? What can we think about having those connections between the site and the host community um, with spaces enough still, we I mean, want people to connect maybe and to, um, to look after each other, but do we still need open spaces for emergencies at the same time? And I want to talk lastly, um, we've got about five minutes, about some site planning interventions, again, very generally. Uh, I just want to warn you that in most urban areas, in parks, in plazas, on the grounds of schools or colleges or mosques, there are some things as a site planner, you're just not gonna be able to realistically do most of the time. I won't say 100%, but, well, I did. I said, what you'll never be able to do. Okay, what you'll never be able to do. Probably, you'll never be able to just come in with a bulldozer and just plow through the park or plow through the, the historic plaza. Um, similarly, you're probably not going to be able to totally change the gradient of the land of the site, even if there's nobody there. Um, you might be able to create new roads inside the site, but it's very unlikely you're gonna be able to create new roads in the middle of buildings, in the middle of a city, outside of the site. And similarly, there's probably not so much scope for massive redirection of drainage outside the site, around and in the city. So therefore, most of the time, we have to think, I would say, large scale rather than, sorry, small scale, sorry, rather than large scale. Um, thinking about having lots of smaller interventions, these can be done quickly. Um, each one individually is cheaper than one big intervention. Possibly it's easier to just to get everybody to agree to something if it's small, if it's happening in one corner, rather than something that's happening in the whole area. And if it's a small thing, maybe it's easier to reverse it and to demolish it or to pull it out, to rehabilitate, to uh, get the environment back to normal afterwards. And if it's small and if it's simple, maybe even when the project is finished, other people living in the site can copy those things themselves. We need, therefore, to have realistic objectives and priorities. Um, what I've put here, quote, is that it's actually a prayer, um, but it's give me the courage to change the things I can change. Um, the forbearance, holding back and not getting involved if I can't change. And how do I know the difference, the wisdom to tell the difference between what I can change and what I can't change. And I think somehow we have to look for all of those things, the priorities that I was talking about, everything that's necessary, possibly life-saving, and what's possible. And what is the overlap? You'll only ever be able to do things which are 
necessary and possible at the same time, whether that is possible or not possible because of budget, because of materials, because of political decisions or anything else. For emergency routes, um, main routes are often in cities with a lot of activity uh, encroached by shops, shopping activity. Um, one thing that's worked in the past is actually talking with the shopkeepers or talking with the local trade organization um, or talking uh, through religious leaders with the shop owners groups um, for what we call win-win situations where everybody gets something. So trying to pull the shops back in order so that you can get better drainage so that the shopping area it generally is cleaner, safer, more friendly, or getting the shops to pull back, you can put in some extra lighting, but it also means that those light poles define a wider street or a wider path for evacuation or for emergency access or things like that. And in these cases, you can use light poles, but you can also use drainage channels, possibly, again, some places it's difficult to dig into the ground, um, as what we call underground walls. Drainage channels also stop people putting shops nearer and nearer and nearer. Um, what about uh, drainage and public health? Basically, the one big thing to figure out is where will all the water go out of the site? Um, if you know that, and to be honest, I know that uh, there's already been sessions by Andrea covering a lot of these issues, so I'm not going to spend much time here. Um, but just to say that in these sort of spontaneous, often closely built urban areas, um, work with your drainage experts, your wash experts, um, and, and local authorities to start thinking possibly more about a network of small drains, a very fine network, rather than just one big central drain coming through. Um, keeping in mind the fact that small drains might be easier to dig into spaces or insert into spaces, but they are also much more easily blocked and need to be maintained. Um, fire safety. This is the priorities, get people out of the fire, um, get emergency services to respond to the fire, have passive fire breaks to stop this fire spreading. I've put in facilities for responding to the fire. Inside the site, can you put in areas which have got sand buckets, um, fire extinguishers, fire extinguishing uh, spades, things like that? Where do you put them? Again, not just are they there? That might be somebody from camp management, but site planning might have ideas about where to put them, how to decentralize, how to spread them. And just to remember, fire spreads over your head as well as along the ground. Think again about this question of uh, encroachment of people building closer and closer and look upwards to see what's happening at the roof level as well. Gender-based violence. Um, often, there are attacks, there are threats of attacks, but also women and girls may just not feel comfortable or not feel safe going to school, going to the shops, going to health posts, having a normal life. Um, if they just simply can't see what's going to happen. Um, another reason to try and get a sort of rationalization of paths into at least some areas, um, but also thinking about, again, this uh, question of sort of what I call watchful eyes, people who are community leaders, informal community leaders, looking after the place, keeping an eye out, sitting outside, watching what's happening. Um, where do they spend their days? How can we decentralize that? How can we support that with spaces for them? How would they feel comfortable? And also, if we think that there might be risks, particularly for girls, and women, but also for men and boys, getting to different places. Can we look at alternative routes to avoid hot spots, to avoid high risk places, or as just alternatives for escape? And who should I talk to this? 
Um, what actors exist? What other organizations exist? Maybe ones who've never been in the site before, but who might be in the local community. And how do I identify those? And then looking at support for livelihoods and community. Uh, to be honest, people will already have a really good idea where they want to have a shop, where they want to have a workshop, where they want to look for work. Um, but if we try and decentralize that, it gives more people more chances. Um, often in these sites, it's the edges and the fronts of the sites, the entrances and the edges, which become the natural economic areas. It's actually the middle of the site, uh, which becomes a bit more empty. But what can we use as anchors to encourage people um, to visit those middle areas or to think about putting a, a small shop in those middle areas? And maybe then the shopkeeper can also be the person with the watchful eyes looking out for making sure that everything is still safe as well. Um, just before the end, I want to say what happens next? It's a process. Um, site planning is also a process. If the, you can be a victim of your own success, I wanted to say. If, if you build really good areas inside a site, they'll become more popular and then more crowded and then at higher risk. And then who's left behind and who needs extra support? And lastly, the end of the site's lifespan. We know that there are sites in urban areas uh, which have been in existence for 50 years. But we hope that as soon as it is safe, people can go back home. Um, we need to plan for that from the beginning, needless to say, uh, even if we don't know when it's going to happen. Um, closing a site, normally we say do it in phases. In sites in urban areas, um, what does this mean? Um, does this mean if you're in a hybrid that you uh, close all of the areas around, but the people living in the original building are staying? Um, what does it mean if it's in a plaza? Uh, do you close first the area where people can come back and have the most economic activity? Or do you close the area first where there's the most damage to the historical buildings, which need to be rehabilitated? Or do you close the area first that's had the most drainage problems and refuse problems? What's the choices? And you need to talk through those choices with everybody all of the time. Remember, the people who leave last are always gonna be the most vulnerable, the people who can't leave on their own, the people who need more protection. And this goes back to a question, not just of identifying access to basic services, but making sure that that access is actually there all the way until the end. And then finding out who do you talk, not with the people who were on the site, because they probably have gone, who do you talk with in the host community about the environmental aspects of a phased recovery? And that, I think, gets us to exactly 15 minutes past the hour. Um, thank you very, very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so I can see other people again. And just, um, I've got a little bit more time. If anybody does want to ask any questions or share their own experiences or even, you know, put photos up on the chat or anything like that. But I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you and see you next week.